Today, um, only a few days after remembering 9-11, I, I don't know how you are, but I really have a hard time remembering 9-11. I have a hard time watching it on TV you know, they, when they read the names. Um, it's been, what, 18 years now? Um, and it's very hard still. Um, and I don't think it would be any less painful based on the number of people who lost their lives that day. I mean, it's just painful all around. But um, one of the books that sat on my shelf, uh, unread for, the long, for years actually, but I finally read six months ago, uh, told of a, an incredibly terrible tragedy that is now 25 years old. And um, it's about the Rwandan genocide. Um, I wasn't gonna start this way, because it's so hard to hear in some ways, but I was at a golf tournament yesterday, a charity golf tournament yesterday for Hope International, and afterward, um, as they were talking about the organization, um, I answered a question. Somebody asked a question, I answered a question. He said, oh, you win a free book, because you answered the question right. So I got a book, and the author of the book was right there in the room uh, yesterday. No, no, this is Friday, I'm sorry. And I, and I said, well, I'm going to go get him to sign my book. I don't usually win a book and usually don't win a book when the author's there. So I had him sign it and he, we just got to talking and he said, yeah, I lived in Rwanda for three years. He had put a picture up of a guy who had lost his leg, not because of the genocide, but I said, you're kidding. I, I'm thinking about starting my sermon about Rwanda. I said, this is really confirmation. So no matter how heavy it gets, I really think I'm supposed to start this way. So here's, the, here's a snippet from the Bishop of Rwanda. The subtitle is Finding Forgiveness Amid, Amidst a Pile of Bones. Here's just a few sentences from the author's introduction. The book was published 2007. In 1994, at least 1 million, 117 thousand innocent people were massacred in a horrible genocide in Rwanda, my homeland in Central Africa. We're still finding bodies buried in pits, dumped in rivers, chopped in pieces. I speak through my own pain. My 16-year-old niece, whom I dearly loved, was raped and killed in a torturous, horrible way. Why would anyone do such a terrible thing? But the pain of Rwanda is not just in the survivors of the brutal acts or in those who lost someone dear to them. It is in the killers as well. It is a great burden to carry around such guilt, especially when so many were killed by people that they knew. That is why so many prisoners burst into tears after they've repented and been forgiven by the very people who suffered at their hands. Now that snippet provides a sense of the book's contents and it's <clears throat> it's hard to read, but it raises an important question. What do we do with guilt? How does God deal with someone or someones who have committed such grievous sins? The kind that we would find, apart from God's grace, impossible to forgive in ourselves or in others. How does God deal with a person who's made such evil choices? What do we do with guilt? Uh, what, what's your guilt quotient today? You know, it's, it's interesting. Our, our default in our self-absorbed culture is usually to excuse ourselves or to rationalize. But sometimes we can be burdened. And it's possible that someone sits here today feeling quite guilty, possibly feeling that they can't be forgiven. I, as you know, I go Tuesday nights to Hickey School, and lately this one kid has just been writing down on a piece of paper, please pray that God will forgive my sins. I mean, every week, that's the prayer. And we keep trying to tell him when we're talking to him in small groups, God has forgiven your sins. So please pray that God will forgive my sins. I mean, he just keeps going on. And, I, and, and, I, so it, and maybe if it's not that, some of us can feel like our past mistakes or sins are put us forever on God's B list. Uh, that somehow we harbor the belief that sooner or later that we're going to get it. And when we do get it, whatever it is, it's going to be deserved. 
And all of that brings us to our text today from 1 Timothy 1, because as the apostle sends a letter to his friend and mentee, Timothy, he inserts this paragraph that's been referred to a couple times already today, of what his past life was like, and it was, it was ugly. But as we read it, we'll, we'll see that his purpose wasn't to grovel in his sins and in his guilt. It was to speak about how he'd been changed, how he'd been freed by the God of mercy and grace and love. And just a quick context, he's writing to Timothy, he's trying to tell him, look, keep your eye on the ball, preach the gospel, don't get distracted by all these philosophies that are out here in this world trying to tell you that there's other ways that you can get to God and all of that. Stay on focus. And then he put, I think he puts this parentheses in here just to say, look here, this is what God can really do when somebody hears the gospel. Here's how, here's how God can change a life. And it's my life. And so I want to pray and, and, and read this passage. And as it's preached, I pray that it'll change us in some way today. And instead of just me just praying for it, here's what I want to ask you to do. As we're in a mindset of prayer, would you just put out your hand towards me and just say, Lord, speak through Pastor George. In your heart, in your mind, just put your hand out and say that. And would you just pray now that you put your hand on your heart and just say, Lord, speak to me. Speak to me today. Lord, Lord, speak through us. Speak in us. Speak to us. We're all in this together. Help us, Lord, as we read. Here's the text. <clears throat> I'm grateful to Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has strengthened me because he judged me faithful and appointed me to his service, even though... I was formerly a blasphemer, a persecutor, and a man of violence. But I received mercy because I acted ignorantly in unbelief, and the grace of our Lord overflowed for me with the faith and love that are in Christ Jesus. The saying is sure, worthy of full acceptance, that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am the foremost. But for that very reason, I received mercy, so that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display the utmost patience making me an example to those who would come to believe in him for eternal life. To the king of ages, immortal, invisible, the only God, be honor and glory forever and ever. When we listen between the lines of this short passage, Paul is speaking, he mentions Jesus many times, and he speaks more about what Jesus has done than about what he had done. But he knew that what Jesus had done had to do with what he had done. So I want to just share three takeaways that I see for us today, especially for anybody who needs God's touch today because of just living under a false narrative that I deserve my guilt or I deserve something from God's hand because of who I am. And, and at the end, I'm going to give you a heads up, at the end we're going to provide an invitation to receive or renew ourselves in Jesus because I know in my spirit that while God wants to speak to each of us in some way. I believe that God's been speaking to some of us today for a while and that maybe this is the morning to change out folded arms for his open arms. I, I don't know. We don't know. We, you know. We've been talking about this all week. We don't know what God is going to do. But we want to provide space for God to do it in. So the passage opens with gratitude to Jesus for saving him from the terrible place he was in in verses 12 and 13. He says, I thank God that he saved me, that he strengthened me, that he put me into service. Uh, and he's basically saying this, when I was acting abominably as the worst version of myself, God in Christ moved toward me, not away from me. And the takeaway is this, God is moving toward us today, right now. No matter how badly any of us thinks of ourselves, every time we worship, every time we come here, Every time we celebrate the sacraments, every time we praise him, God, Jesus is here. He promised that he'd be here. He's here today, and he comes toward us today. Paul spoke of himself twice as the foremost of sinners, the chief, the worst, the first of all the worst. And he says he, he, he expressed this in three ways. He said, listen, one, I was a blasphemer. I spoke evil against God, and, and he would never do that as a Pharisee, right? Right? 
but he did against Jesus, which means that he perceived Jesus to be God in the flesh. So he said, I blasphemed against Jesus. And then he says, I was a persecutor. I hated the people of Jesus. And then he says, I was a violent man. And that word means arrogant, aggressive man who didn't just want to arrest Christians. He wanted to make them suffer. And that he delighted in their suffering. That's what he says about himself. He was a scholar in the law. He knew all the terrible Old Testament stories. He knew about murderers, Moses and David. He knew about all the things that caused Israel to be sent into exile. And yet in spite of all of that, and this impressive list in, verse, in chapter 1, verses 9 and 10, he puts a great list of sins in there. And prior to his confession, he says he's the worst. He's talking past tense, but then he says he is the worst, present tense. What's that about? because he thought he was okay without God, as God was. He thought he was okay with God as he thought about who God was, but he thought he was okay without God who really revealed God's self. He was actually fighting against Jesus, the Son of God. And maybe he's just expressing that poverty that Jesus spoke about in the Beatitudes when he says, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. When we know that we're impoverished, that we need God. But Jesus broke into his self-righteous ignorance and now he expresses thankfulness. You know, what we express thankfulness for says an awful lot about what's going on inside of us. What we're thankful for puts the spotlight on our inner person. And here's the thing, when we sin, our natural instinct is to think that God moves away from us because that's what other people do. But Jesus does exactly the opposite according to this text. And the Apostle Paul realized that because when he thought he was at his best, he was really at his worst, Jesus came to him on that road to Damascus and he showed him how blind he was. He blinded him for three days. I often wonder, why did he blind him for three days? I think to underscore the blindness that everybody experiences until Christ breaks in. Have you ever been in the apostle's shoes? I mean, not a religious zealot assassin, but you're just going along in life and then light breaks in. Have you ever spoken to a someone who's had a near-death experience, or have you ever had a near-death experience? I have spoken to someone who had a near-death experience. And here's what, it, here's what happens with people who've had near-death experiences. There's a before and there's an after. The after is life has a new lens. Everything is seen through a new lens. People who've had these experiences are grateful for every single second that they, that they have. They feel like they're living on borrowed time and they have no hesitation telling their stories to other people. Well, when we become aware of what we're really like apart from God, it's like a near-death experience because the wages of sin is death. Now, I said sin, and that's what the Bible says. It doesn't say sins. It says the wages of sin is death. See, sins, with an S, are the consequences of what is wrong. They're not the cause. Sin, singular, is the cause. And just think about this for a minute. The word sin has absolutely no meaning apart from a relationship with God. If there was no God, the word sin wouldn't even make sense, right? See, the root of sin is located in how we perceive a relationship with God or not. Sin is not just a feeling of unworthiness, because most people don't feel that way. Sin involves the real situation of all human beings before God, whether we realize it or not. And when we have the pain of guilt, that's like God shouting to us. Before God, it isn't enough to say nobody's perfect or we'll all, we all make mistakes. Listen to how C.S. Lewis put it. Fallen man is not simply an imperfect creature who needs improvement. He is a rebel who must lay down his arms. 
But here, listen, this text is so wonderful. The theological beauty of the Apostles' Confession is this. He could never speak of himself as a sinner like this until he knew that Jesus had come and freed him already from his predicament. That's why he was so grateful that Jesus moved toward him. Fleming Rutledge, who wrote the book The Crucifixion, says, we cannot rejoice to think of ourselves as sinful unless we already are claimed by the divine light of the gospel. You see, people who don't know Jesus don't go around calling themselves sinners, just the opposite. And it's the people who know Jesus who do this because they know from what they've been rescued. See, God's provided forgiveness. That's what I love. I love preaching under this cross. God has provided forgiveness already. The question is, will you ignore the gift or will you receive the gift? Will you insist on living life on your own terms or his? Will you lay down your arms and receive his forgiveness? Because Jesus is here. He's moving. He's always moving toward us every time we gather. So that's the first takeaway, that in his mess, Jesus moved toward him. The second thing is that he says, when I was acting abominably in the worst version of myself, I received mercy in my unbelief. The grace of the Lord overflowed for me. Overflow, you know, like a river overflowing. It just knew no bounds. It didn't stay within its boundaries. It just overflowed with the faith and love in Christ Jesus. So here's takeaway number two. Not only is God moving toward you, he is doing so with an overflowing grace to forgive you and to change you. He wants an encounter. He wants a transaction. He wants to change your life for his. He wants to change you experientially so that you know that there's a before and after, so that you can say, I was formerly like this. The word mercy is used 78 times in the New Testament. And in its use, it doesn't simply mean to have merciful feelings. You know, somebody says, I pity you. I really pity you. Mercy is not like that. Mercy always involves action on God's part. When people cried out to Jesus, Lord, have mercy on me, he acted, he touched, he healed. When he healed the demon-possessed man, he told him, go and tell others what mercy God has shown on you. So the man could say, here's what my life was like before Jesus touched me, and look at me now. There's a before and an after. And that man is a metaphor for each of us. We're bound. No one can help us out of our sin, singular situation. Somebody outside has to break in. Think about superhero movies, especially superheroes like Superman or Thor. The superheroes who have to come from another realm into our realm because some alien power is trying to take over the earth or is trying to end civilization. And if this superhero didn't come in and counteract that, we'd all be doomed. Well, that's the way sin singular is. It's a power over us. And here's the deal. Our sin, having it as a disease, the kind of we have, is a debt that we can't pay. It's a predicament from which we cannot extricate ourselves. And here's a question to consider. Even if you put yourself in the gospel story or not, think about this. If you were watching it as a movie and you saw, I don't know if anybody's seen um, Mel Gibson's movie, what did he call it? The Passion, The Passion of Christ. But if you look at that and you see that, no matter what else you think about it, wouldn't you think that that crucifixion, that historical fact points to a real problem. If that's what somebody had to go through, thinking that they were helping them, that's really problematic. One author said, so catastrophic a remedy demands a catastrophic predicament. See, no human being can settle our situation with God. No human being can do it. No human being can do enough good stuff to say, okay, God, did I pay you back enough? If humanity has a problem that they can't extricate themselves from, and only God 
can do it, then it takes a God-man to do it. The cross was dehumanizing to the extreme. The cross was humiliating to the extreme. The cross was degrading to the extreme. Why? Because capital S sin has the power to dehumanize, humiliate, and degrade, and all you have to do is turn on the TV, read a newspaper to see that proved every single day. When people say, well, God will just forgive me, that minimizes our offense. It dismisses the gravity of sin. It dismisses the power that sin has over us. Think about it. If you were in Rwanda during the reconciliation time and somebody killed your father or your brother or your sister or your mother and the killer's now sitting here in your hut asking you to forgive him, what is he going to give you that's going to square things up? Not a blessed thing. What are we going to give to God? We can't give anything to God. This, because ultimately all that stuff is a sin against God, not a sin against his people. We need rescue from outside of ourselves because this undefeated, undefeatable alien power and its guilt can't be defeated in any other way. Jesus incarnate in the flesh coming from heaven without sin came to take away sin and change our reality. Receiving Christ is, is, is uh, described elsewhere as being a new creation. The old has passed away, the new has come. We don't, we're not under the dominion of sin anymore, Paul says elsewhere. Sin always means separation. When we die, our physical bodies are separated from our spirit. In spiritual death, we're separated from God. And Paul says, you were dead in your trespasses and sins, but God made you alive. And that's why he makes his billboard declaration in verse 15 that the saying is sure and worthy of full acceptance. Um, if we were to use modern parlance today, we would say, here's a word you can take to the bank. Here's a word that you can bet your life on. Here's a word that you can hang your hat on. I mean, he's saying this is a word, a worthy word, Worthy there means heavy. It's like when you put something down on a scale and, it, and, and the weight of the scale goes down. It's heavy. He says, here's a heavy word. You're like back in the 60s when hippies would hear something that they thought was cool. They go, well, that's heavy, man. Right? Here's a word that you can bet on. Christ Jesus came in this world to save sinners. Boom. And I'm the worst and the save here means not only forgiveness of sins, it means freedom from sin's power. Elsewhere, Paul said sin didn't have dominion. Save means more than entrance into heaven. Save means power to be different on earth now. So Paul says, God moved toward me in my ignorance. God forgave and changed me from my worst self experientially. And the third thing that Paul says is that when I was acting abominably inside of my worst self, God in Christ appointed me for his purposes. The takeaway is this. God still, or God wants to, use you no matter what. I don't care what your record is. Turned over to God. He wants to use you. See, that's why he says he was the poster child of sinners. I was the first place winner of sinners so that Jesus could demonstrate his incredible long-suffering forbearance to put me on display as a sketch, as a pattern, as an outline to show that he wasn't done, he wasn't disgusted with me, but he wanted to enlist me actually for his cause. So that those who would see it would come and believe also and never have the excuse to say, oh, I can't, I can't, I can't forgive me. There's a, there's a takeaway for us. The point of our worst shame, the point of our worst pain, the point of our worst weakness can be transformed into our greatest purpose in life. There's just so many illustrations of that. But you can never know what that is apart from a sincere confession of what you're really like without Jesus Christ and a sincere cry to receive his mercy and his love and his grace to come to believe in him for real life, for eternal life. And you know the proof that this has taken place in your heart? Humility, clearly. Gratitude, clearly but also doxology. 
praise. He can't help himself in verse 17. He's telling his little story, and all of a sudden he goes, oh my gosh, he starts to praise God. To the King eternal, immortal, the only wise God. To him be the glory. He, he, just, he, just, goes, he just can't stop, help himself. And that's what happens when Jesus comes to us, forgives us, changes us, and commissions us to be his own. Let me just close here a minute. You know, John Newton is an example of this. Many of us know John Newton was a slave trader. He was in competition with Paul for being the worst um, as a slave trader. And I don't know, have you ever seen his headstone? Seen John Newton's headstone? I was going to throw a picture up here, but it's too wordy, but I'll give you the cliff notes of his headstone, believe it or not. And before I read it to you, um, I want to ask you, what would you want to have read, put on your gravestone? I mean, if you go throughout cemeteries today, you usually see platitudes. You don't see much else, unless it's, unless it's an old, old one, you know? Uh, so here's Newton's headstone, cliff, cliff notes. John Newton, once an infidel, translation, a person who neither acknowledged God or cared a whit about God and actually cursed God. John Newton, once an infidel, and libertine, here's the translation of that, one who has no, had no moral compass, who just lived a hedonistic lifestyle and could care less about what he did to people. John Newton, infidel and libertine, a servant of slaves in Africa. Actually, one time in Africa, he, for three years, he was a slave to a queen in Africa. Anyway, he goes, a servant of slaves in Africa. Here's the most, most important part. Was by the rich mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ preserved, restored, and pardoned and appointed to preach the faith he had long labored to destroy. You know what? When Jesus said on the cross, Father, forgive them, they don't know what they're doing. And Paul says here that Jesus is demonstrating his utmost forbearance and patience. <laughs> right now, Jesus is still speaking from the cross. He's still being patient from the cross. He's still saying, today, I really, really hope people will hear this and respond so they can be free. So the Lord is here today. He wants to forgive you. He wants to change you. He wants to use you. And if you've never received him before, he's calling you to receive him today. And we're, we have an opportunity to do that. And, if, and if, if you have pushed him away, you know, John Newton, he became a Christian on a, on a, on a voyage across the sea, but it wasn't maybe, maybe three or four years later that he felt like he was really saved because he then renounced slavery. So I don't know where you are, but if you need God's light touch, God's forgiving touch, I'm inviting you to come forward in a few minutes. There's water in this font. It just reminds us of the water of baptism. If you want to put your hand in the water just to remind you that Jesus cleanses us from sin, that, that it's a renewing moment for you, um, then you can do that. You don't have to do that. Um, and we're going to have folks right along the floor here. And kind of like communion, but it's really not communion. It's an opportunity just to say, I need, I need help today. I need something today from God, and I'm not afraid to ask for it. So I'm going to pray. The, the musicians are going to come up, and then, uh, and then we'll just leave room for God's Spirit to do whatever God would like to do. We've been, we've been praying, and, and um, so I want you to be praying too. Let, let's close in prayer. Lord, thank you for the gospel, the good news of Jesus that all for sin could not atone, Christ and Christ alone. Um, like the word in Rock of Ages, of no matter what I do, no matter how much I did, only your blood can cleanse. Help us to know what we're really like apart from you today. Help us to know that you don't leave us there. And just meet us here in whatever way that need is expressed in each person's heart. We ask